Hey everybody, this is the Daily Bible Reading for June the 28th. Let's dive right in. And I'm hanging out here at the well, and I uh, figured this is a great home, home base to read the Word from. So, hope you're all having a great day. Let's see what the Lord's saying in His Word, and how He dealt with the kings. We're in the second book of Kings, chapter 13 and 14 today. So here we go, June 28th, 2 Kings 13. And you know, yesterday I did overlap. I got through, yeah, I think I actually I read 13 yesterday. I was so into Je Jehoahaz's rules in Israel. So we kind of started in 13, uh, but I'm going to pick it up according to the reading just to catch up there in case you're catching up with me here. So just to stay on track with the OneYearBibleOnline.com daily reading, June 28th. Here we go, 13 and 14 of Second Kings. So Jehoahaz, son of Jehu, began to rule over Israel in the 23rd year of King Joash's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria 17 years, but he did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He followed the example of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, continuing the sins that Jeroboam had led Israel to commit. So, folks, there you go. It happens. This is kind of the, the quick history of nations and of people groups and so on. Like, did the leaders help them follow the Lord or did they fall away? Now, it doesn't necessarily happen in New Testament times, but it kind of rings true. Um, anyway, I'm going to move on. Won't do commentary there. So the Lord was angry with Israel, and he allowed King Hazael of Aram and his son Ben-Hadad to defeat them repeatedly. Then Jehoaz prayed for the Lord's help, and the Lord heard his prayer, for he could, he could see how severely the king of Aram was oppressing Israel. See, God still loves Israel. Can't get away from that. So the Lord provided someone to rescue the Israelites from the tyranny of the Arameans. Then Israel lived in safety again as they had in former days. But they continued to sin following the evil example of Jeroboam. They also allowed the Asherah pole in Samaria to remain standing. Finally, Jehoaz's army was reduced to 50 charioteers, 10 chariots, and 10,000 foot soldiers. The king of Aram had killed the others, trampling them like dust under his feet. The rest of the events in Jehoahaz's reign, everything he did and the extent of his power, are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Of course it is. When Jehoahaz died, he was buried in Samaria. Then his son Joash be became the next king. Jo jo Jehoash, or jo Jehoash, that is his name, Jehoash, son of Jehoaz, began to rule over Israel in the 37th year of King Joash, Joash's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria 16 years, but he did what was evil in the Lord's sight. There you go again. He refused to turn from the sins that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had led Israel to commit. Yes, it's hard for a lineage to change. It takes a strong character, something where somebody responds to the voice of God. As it is in modern days with families, sometimes when a family's not following the Lord, it gets stuck there for a while until somebody steps in. Anyway, verse 12 of chapter 13 here. The rest of the events in Joe Hash's reign and everything he did, including the extent of his power and his war with King Amaziah of Judah, are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. When Jehoash died, he was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. Then his son Jeroboam II became the next king. So I am overlapping, but I just want to be on track with the reading. Hang in there. When Elisha, this is good to emphasize Elisha's last days, when was in his last illness. What a funny way to put it. King Jehoash of Israel visited him and wept over him. My father, my father, I see the chariots and charioteers of Israel, he cried. Elisha told him, get a bow and some arrows. And the king did as he was told. Elisha told him, put your hand on the bow. And Elisha laid his own hand on, on his hands on the king's hands. Remember this? I hit this yesterday. Then he commanded, open that eastern window. And he opened it. Then he said, shoot. So he shot an arrow. Elisha proclaimed, this is the Lord's arrow, an arrow of victory over Aram, for you will complete conquer, you will completely conquer the Arameans at Aphek. 
Then he said, Now pick up the other arrows and strike them against the ground. So the king picked them up and struck the ground three times, but the man of God was angry with him. You should have struck the ground five or six times, he exclaimed. Then you would have beaten a ram until it was, enti until it was entirely destroyed. Now you will be victorious only three times. Something I'm still pondering here and investigating. Then Elisha died and was buried. There you go. Groups of Moabite raiders used to invade the land each spring. Once, uh, sorry, groups of Moabite raiders used to invade the land each spring. Once when some Israelites were burying a man, they spied a band of these raiders, so they hastily threw the corpse into the tomb of Elisha and fled. But as soon as the body touched Elisha's bones, the dead man revived and jumped to his feet. I wonder if the guy stuck around to see this guy come to life. Wow, amazing. King Hazael of Aram had oppressed Israel during the entire reign of King Jehoahaz. But the Lord was gracious and merciful to the people of Israel, and they were not totally destroyed. He pitied them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? You're starting to follow God's faithfulness even when people are rebellious. God made a promise, and he's trying to help nations reach him. Wow. And to this day, he still has not completely destroyed them or banished them from his presence. Of course not. God held on to Israel for the sake of the bloodline, which would bring Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. Right? There you go. That's why Jesus, or the Lord God, is sustaining Israel through history. King Hazael of Aram died, and his son Ben-Hadad became the next king. Then Jehoash, son of Jehoaz, recaptured from Ben-Hadad, ben son of Hazael, the towns that had been taken from Joash's father, Jehoaz. Joash defeated Ben-Hadad on three occasions, and he recovered the Israelite towns. All right, for June 28th, now we do chapter 14. Here we go. Amaziah, son of Joash, began to rule over Judah in the second year of the reign of King Joash of Israel. Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother was Johadin, or Johadin, from Jerusalem. Amaziah did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, but not like his ancestor David. Instead, he followed the example of his father Joash. Amaziah did not destroy the pagan shrines, and the people still offered sacrifices and burned incense there. Ah, yeah. Won't comment. You see the patterns. Yeah, they needed to be completely the Lord's. There can't be God first and then some other God second. <laughs> but we got God and we got Jesus. We're going to just throw in some other ones too for that silliness. Verse 5. When Amaziah was well established as king, he executed the officials who had assassinated his father. However, he did not kill the children of the assassination of the assassins for he obeyed the command of the Lord as written by Moses in the book of the law. Ah, parents must not be put to death for the sins of their children, nor children for the sins of their parents. Those deserving to die must be put to death for their own crimes. There you go, folks. That's a principle of the Lord that should stand. Every individual stands on their own merit or lack thereof, right? Why should a parent suffer because of their children, or vice versa. Moving on, Amaziah also killed 10,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. He also conquered Selah and changed its name to Jokfiel, as it is called to this day. One day, Amaziah sent messengers with this challenge to Israel's king Johash, the son of Jehoaz and grandson of Jehu, come and meet me in battle. They're just wanting to fight all the time. Verse 9, but King Joash of Israel replied to King Amaziah of Judah with this story. Out in the Lebanon hills, or mountains, a thistle sent a message to a mighty cedar tree. Give your daughter in marriage to my son. But just then a wild animal of Lebanon came by and stepped on the thistle, crushing it. <laughs> you have indeed defeated Edom, and you are very proud of it. But be content with your victory and stay at home. Why stir up trouble? That will only bring disaster on you and the people of Judah. He's trying to give him an out and out, because he's his troops, his his whole strength is more powerful. All right, moving on. Verse eleven. But Amazi refused to listen. 
stubborn and foolish. So King Joash of Israel mobilized his army against King Amaziah of Judah. The two armies drew up their battle lines hmm. at Beth Shemesh in Judah. Judah was routed by the army of Israel and its army scattered and fled for home. King Joash of Israel captured Judah's king, Amaziah, son of Joash, and grandson of Ahaziah at Beth Shemesh. Then he marched to Jerusalem where he demolished 600 feet of Jerusalem's wall from, Eph from the Ephraim gate to the corner gate. He carried off all the gold and silver and all the articles from the temple of the Lord. He also seized the treasures from the royal palace along with hostages and then returned to Samaria. The rest of the events in Joash's reign and everything he did, including the extent of his power and his war with King Amaziah of Judah, are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. When Joash died, he was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel, and his son Jeroboam II became the next king. King Amaziah of Judah lived for 15 years after the death of King Jeho Joash of Israel. The rest of the events in Amaziah's reign are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. There, were, there was a conspiracy against Amaziah's life in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish, but his enemies sent assassins after him, and they killed him there. They brought his body back to Jerusalem on a horse, and he was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. All the people of Judah had crowned Amaziah's 16-year-old son, Uzziah, there you go. So the new, the 16-year-old, the kid is now the king. As king in, his, in the place of his father, Amaziah, after his father's death, Uzziah rebuilt the town of Elath and restored it to Judah. So he had wisdom and he knew his calling. Jeroboam II, the son of Joash, began to rule over Israel in the 15th year of King Amaziah's reign in Judah. Jeroboam reigned in Samaria 41 years. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to turn from the sins that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had led Israel to commit. Jeroboam II recovered the territories of Israel between Labo Hamath and the Dead Sea, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had promised through Jonah, son of Amitai, Amitai the prophet from Goth Hefer. For the Lord saw the bitter suffering of everyone in Israel, and that there was no one in Israel slave or free to help them. And because the Lord had not said he would not, he would, or he not, had not said he would blot out the name of Israel completely, he used Jeroboam the second, the son of Joash, to save them. Here you go. The rest of the events in the reign of Jeroboam the second and everything he did, including the extent of his power, his wars, and how he recovered for Israel, both Damascus and Hamath, which had belonged to Judah, are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. When Jeroboam II died, he was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. Then his son, Zechariah, became the next king. And there you go, June 28th, that finishes chapter 14 in 2 Kings. Let's move on. Today's psalm, June the 28th, is Psalm 146. It's an anonymous author. Now, we've had some King David psalms. Now, we're not sure of this one, but the theme is the help of people versus the help of God. Help from people is temporal and unstable, but help from God is lasting and complete. So, we don't know the author. They're not even guessing here. 146. Praise the Lord. Let all that I am praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God with my dying breath. Ah, yes, Lord, may it be so. Don't put your confidence in powerful people. There is no help for you there. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth, and all their plans die with them. But joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He made heaven and earth the sea and everything in them. He keeps every promise forever. Mm. He gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the godly. The Lord protects the foreigners among us. He cares for the orphans and widows. 
but he frustrates the plans of the wicked. The Lord will reign forever. He will be your God, O Jerusalem, throughout the generations. Praise the Lord. Beautiful psalm, as they all are. All right, June the 28th, Proverbs today. Proverbs 18, verses 2 and 3. Verse 2, fools have no interest in understanding. They, on, they only want to air their own opinions. Uh, pause. Lord, give us wisdom never to be foolish. We want to have understanding. We want to learn. We want to adapt. If we need to understand a truth and we don't get it, let's be honest to admit it. Don't be foolish. Fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinion. I even have a note on the side, Carl, be careful. Yeah, it's not important just to have an opinion. If I'm wrong, I want to change my mind. I want to learn. I want to repent. I want to understand the ways of God to walk with righteousness and integrity. Very, very important. Yes, all right. Verse 3, doing wrong leads to disgrace and scandalous behavior brings contempt. It sure does. All right, that's powerful. If you're hearing some fireworks, I can hear it outside the church here. <laughs> it's getting close to the 4th of July, right? We are at June the 28th, so the neighborhood's already celebrating. All right, the New Testament reading for the 28th of June is Acts 18 through 1912. Now, we're going to pick it up at 1823. Remember, we were almost done with that chapter. And then we'll pick it up at 19 through verse 12. All right. So here we go, Acts 18, verse 23. After spending some time in Antioch, Antioch, <laughs> after spending some time in Antioch, Paul went back through Galatia, or Galatia, but it's Galatia, and Phrygia, visiting and strengthening all the believers. Meanwhile, a Jew named Ap Apollos, an eloquent speaker who knew the scriptures well, had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt. He had been taught the way of the Lord, and he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit, an enthusiastic spirit, and with accuracy. However, he knew only about John's baptism. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, they took him aside and explained the way of God even more accurately. Pause. Even smart people that kind of understand the Lord. We can learn from other people who have a deeper experience. That's, that's key here. Apollos was brilliant. He was very well educated. And see, but some people that had been in the way longer could fill in some things that he didn't know about yet. Baptism being one, which is huge. Apollos had been thinking about, about going to Achaia, and the brothers and sisters in Ephesus encouraged him to go. They wrote to the believers in Achaia, asking them to welcome him. When he arrived there... He proved to be of great benefit to those who, by God's grace, had believed. He refuted the Jews with powerful arguments in public debate. Using the scriptures, he explained to them that Jesus was the Messiah. Mm, pausing again, folks, another example of the disciples, of the church, of believers stepping into culture, debating, challenging thought or thinking. Sometimes I hear people say, the church, we just don't need to do that. We don't need to, it does, it's not conflict. It's not hate to present the truth and to debate, especially great apologetics philosophers that understand the thoroughness of scripture. They're the ones that break through this kind of blockage of intellect. Sometimes people feel like, I've read it, I know, I know everything. No, we don't. We have to stay humble and think, well, I can learn, I can understand something better. And the truths of Christ are so clear that even in their time, they're debating the intellectual community of their region when they are able. And Apollos was well equipped to do that. Okay, moving on, chapter 19 through verse 12. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. Notice this language. Chapter 19, folks, is super important for every believer. No, they replied, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. <laughs> Imagine this. People have come to believe in Jesus. They're hearing his 
stories about what he did, teachings on the kingdom, and yet they don't have the fullness of not understanding that Jesus sent them the Holy Spirit, right? Then what baptism did you experience, he asked, and they replied, the baptism of John. Oh, Paul said John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus as soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Pause. See, it's very clear that Paul baptized them in Jesus' name and then laid hands on them for receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's very clear in Scripture. So if you've never received that, Ask somebody in your church community that knows or your whoever can, another believer that's got it, say, lay hands on me. I want to receive the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Very important. There you go. Man, 12 men and all got it. Verse 8, then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Hmm. Arguing persuasively. See there, folks? Yes, we can challenge people. The more we know, we can speak into people. Arguing. Sometimes like, no, 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 that's not right. And I've told people sometimes like, well, I appreciate your journey. You're searching for God, but that's not right. And to be able to say that is boldness. And, and you have to know the Lord. You want to know enough scripture to relay the message. And you go, I want you to consider the truth of Jesus Christ. Here, read this book. Read the Gospel of John. Check it out. Open your heart to realize this is the truth. This isn't deception. Anyway, there you go. So he's arguing persuasively. I've marked that. Arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn. Hmm. People still do. Rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for the next two years so that people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Two years. Imagine him setting up camp in an area for two years to teach and to present the gospel. God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. Whoa, powerful, folks, powerful. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, was doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? <laughs> Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them and overpowered them and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. Imagine this, a demoniac attacking these guys trying, <laughs> trying to use the name of the Lord and they don't know the Lord. Very important to remember, you got to know the Lord. The enemy knows whose you are. All right, we're going to pause there. I went just a verse or so longer. That's powerful stuff. Book of Acts, the book of Acts just unpacks so much powerful stuff in the early church. The thing to remember is that it was never supposed to stop. And many of churches and communities through the years have moved in power of the Spirit and moved in the Lord's name. And what has happened through, the t through generations is the enemy is always about, if he can't get people not to believe, he wants to diminish the strength of the church. That's one thing that's key. We're seeing a resurgence through different times of history. We've seen big revivals and miracles and groups moving and things and somebody with a special gift. I believe we're seeing a time where the church at large is moving in things unprecedented like we haven't seen be before. And um, But uh, we'll see how that all plays out. I don't want to unpack all that. You can check out different websites. Elijah List is a good one, the prophetic community is speaking into things happening in our day. Anyway, bless you all. That's the daily Bible reading. I'll call it a day for now. We'll see you tomorrow for another. Bye-bye.